Well, it's been a privilege to be here amongst a beautiful atmosphere of Christian unity and uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. Our message to finish off our series of Saved by a Promise. There's more in the series, but I thought I might just present uh, uh, what I can here in this camp meeting. And our title for this message is called The Depository Promise. The Depository Promise. But before we open up with the word of the Lord, let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, our loving, merciful Savior, we bow our knees and our heads before your throne of grace and mercy and justice. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, Father, we know we are sinners in need of your saving grace. Help us to be convicted moment by moment of this very fact. And help us, Lord, to do something about it. To grab and grasp onto your everlasting arms with all our might, strength and reliance so that we may continue to follow you whithersoever you go. At this moment in time, Lord, I'm about to open your word. There is nothing good in me. I am just the dust of the earth, like a flower that blooms yesterday and fades away tomorrow. So please, Lord, hide this human being behind the glory of your word and let your Holy Spirit speak today. As we invite his presence here to be with us, the presence of the holy angels, to fill this room with your glory and help our hearts, Lord, to be convicted with your will and your word as it's proclaimed today and help us to be on fire and move forward to proclaim your message, not only within our homes, within the church, but those outside who have never heard had the chance to hear your word. Help us to be powerful instruments under your guidance and your leadership. In the blessed name of Jesus Christ, Father, we call. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Saved by a promise, the depository promise. Where are we in this presentation? Where are we in this presentation? Well, in the book of Galatians chapter 3, the Bible says in the book of Galatians chapter 3, and in verse 18, the Bible says, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. We are promised an inheritance of eternal life, an inheritance of having mansions in heaven by our Father, God. But the Bible says, if the inheritance of eternal life, immortality, and the mansions of, of heaven, time with God forever and ever, if the inheritance be of the law, in other words, if it comes by because of the law, then it is no more by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. The Bible tells me that in order for me to inherit all things, it's through God's promise. We also found out in the book of Romans chapter 4. A quick revision, Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, and in verse 13 and verse 14, the Bible says, For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of of faith. First, the righteousness of faith of Jesus Christ. Jesus had faith that he acted out the works of faith through his motive, motive, which is love. And not only that, when we accept the works of faith of Jesus Christ, which was motivated by love, by faith, then we bear out the fruits of works of faith motivated by love. And so the Bible says, for if they, in verse 14, for if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. So here we have, remember our first presentation, we opened up Revelation 21 verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. The overcomer overcomes by faith. Amen. 
God's promise was the depository promise. The main promise was the depository promise, which is Jesus Christ. Our role is to accept that depository promise of God by faith. And then we are on our way towards overcoming and inheriting all things. Amen? But then we found out that the law, even though we are not saved by the law, we do not inherit by the law, but the Bible teaches that the law and the promise are not against each other. The law and the promise have a relationship. What is the relationship between the law and the promise? We found out that the law's purpose is to lead the sinner to the sacrificial promise, which is Jesus Christ. The law says to me, Peter, you can never keep me. You can never, you can never um, have the strength to keep the law. But I tell you something, Peter, as the law speaks to me. Look to Jesus, because Jesus is the one that was able to keep my requirements. He was the one that was able to take upon himself the penalty that I handed down for you. So look to Jesus, because Jesus has provided the remedy for you in order to survive and live again. And so, as I look to Jesus, I find out that Jesus becomes the end purpose of the law for me to receive righteousness if I believe in the merits of Christ. Imputed and imparted righteousness is given to me when I accept the works of the law on my behalf, pointing me to Jesus, the Savior. And then we progressed on to the next phase of our presentation. Once we come to Jesus and we accept his works on our behalf by faith, then Jesus says, if any man will come after me, if you want to follow me, take up your cross daily and follow me. We found out that Jesus says, well, if you want to know how to get to heaven, I am the way. I'm not only just the way, I'm also the truth. But not only just the truth, I'm also life. And so begins our journey towards heaven. Not only that we stay here in Calvary and say, well, grace, grace, grace alone is sufficient for me in order to get to heaven. No. Jesus says, the next step is truth. And we found out last night that God is truth. Jesus Christ is truth. The Holy Spirit is truth. The Word of God is truth. And all thy commandments are truth. So therefore, in order for me to progress on my way up to heaven, I must keep whatever God says. Amen? I must keep whatever the Holy Spirit says. I must keep whatever Jesus has spoken and said. I must keep all the words of the Scriptures because it's truth, including the spirit of prophecy. I must also keep all thy commandments which are truth, including the Sabbath. And this is where most of Christianity fail in their progression to heaven. Because they're stuck in the way. They reject the commandments of God and therefore they fail to progress towards heaven. And so, the end result is life. We talked about the truth last night and we found out we investigated the word of God. And we found out that Jesus says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, Matthew 28, verse 18 down to 20, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So when Jesus commanded us to teach all things, what are the all things that he commanded us to teach? Was it comics or was it uh, PlayStation or, was, what, or is it the Word of God? It's the Word of God. And is the Word of God truth? So we are to go and proclaim all truth, everything that the Word of God says. And we applied that to the last days, that the message that Christ had called us to preach in the last days is the three angels' message. Isn't that true? Amen. So we must teach all things whatsoever the first, second, third angels proclaim. Because we are the representative. We are the ones that represent the angels. Isn't that true? Angels, angelos, messengers. As God de depicts the angels flying in the midst of heaven. No longer horsepower. Amen? 
Horsepower is out of the question. That's in the past. Now the angels are flying in the midst of heaven, proclaiming the gospel to the world. And so if we don't proclaim what's coming out of the mouth of the angels, if we withhold because we fear the people and because we fear the papacy and because we fear leadership and whatever it is that we might fear, then the Bible says we have taken the words out of the mouth of the angels. Therefore, our names are taken out of the book of lives. It's, it's, it's important. It's gravely important. And so here is where we are today as we progress through this presentation. Galatians 3 verse 16, you see, we know that Christ is the sacrificial promise. Adam and Eve sinned. They could never have kept the law at that time when they sinned because they are, now they are in bondage to the devil. The devil has kept them under his grasp and his power. Jesus Christ comes along. How do I know it was Jesus Christ that sought them? Because Jesus Christ stood before man and God. But the Bible says the Lord walked through the garden in the cool of the day. And that word Lord is in capital letters, which means Jehovah, the self-existent one. In other words, Jesus is Jehovah, self-existent. But he was seeking out man and woman in Genesis 3.15 and proclaimed to man and woman at that point in time when they had fallen, he said, don't worry. I'm coming. There's a seed that's going to be born through fallen human nature. And that seed is going to come and conquer the devil. Amen? And that seed, of course, is Christ. The Bible says, Galatians 3 verse 16, Now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one as do thy seed, which is Christ. Christ made it all possible for us to overcome the sacrificial promise. What about the Holy Spirit? In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 down to verse 13, the Bible says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So is the Holy Spirit a promise? Yeah? The Bible says the Holy Spirit of promise. So Christ is not only the promise that God had given to the human race. The Holy Spirit is God's promise. And so the Bible says this, verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Jesus. In other words, there was a sinner who was searching and there was a proclamation of the gospel about Jesus Christ and somehow that sinner came across the proclamation of the gospel and heard about Jesus Christ and the plan of salvation. Then he first accepted Jesus' merits and first trusted in Jesus. Then the Bible says, In whom ye also trusted. After that, ye heard the word of truth. After hearing the word of truth about the plan of salvation, they heard, they trust in the merits of Jesus Christ. The gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So somehow, the Bible says, as soon as we accept the plan of salvation, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That doesn't mean the Holy Spirit didn't exist beforehand. The Bible says in Ephesians 1 verse 14, which is, the word which is, is referring to the verse prior, talking about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. That word earnest, if you have a look there, it means part of the pur purchase money or property given in advance as security for the rest, a pledge. So the Holy Spirit is a pledge or God's pledge or God's deposit, depository promise. It's, his, it's a part that God has given to ensure that we enter into the inheritance. Amen? When you pay for a house or something, 
or a car, you have a deposit that you need to put in. Isn't that right? And when you put that deposit in, it tells the person that you have uh, uh, purchased, purchased the house from that you are prepared to finish off the contract. Isn't that true? But God is prepared to finish off our walk to the point where we enter into inheritance and what he has given for that is the Holy Spirit of promise. Once we accept the plan of salvation, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is the earnest, the deposit. God has given a deposit so that we can have inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. In other words, we are purchased with a price. And that price was the life of the Son of God. And in order for us to finalize this purchase or to be made sure that we have already paid our debt or, and so forth, God has given us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is one of the parties involved in the plan of salvation. We know that God the Father is involved. What role has He taken? He's taken the Supreme Father in Heaven, God, Judge, and so forth. But then He has given the judgment to Jesus. Christ is involved. Who is Christ? Only begotten Son. Amen. What else? What other titles does he have? Everlasting Father. The Lamb that was slain. Prince of Peace. What was that? The Lion of the tribe of Judah. Michael. King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Okay. Jesus has many titles in the Bible. Amen? But I'd like to suggest John 1 verse 1 and 2. There was a time when John was dealing with uh, this issue during his lifetime. And John was probably thinking, how could I bring about the fact about who Jesus really is? And so there is no word to describe beginning, for God has no beginning. And so he said, in the beginning... Was who? Word. Was the Word. And the Word was with who? God. God. And the Word was? God. Was God. You see, I didn't come with my wife today. But if I did, I would have, Peter would have come with his wife. Isn't that true? His wife is not Peter, and Peter is not his wife. But he came with his wife. So therefore, you have two separate beings there. Isn't that true? And so John was trying to emphasize the fact that Jesus Christ is God. And the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He created all things and so forth. So here we see that Christ is involved, and Christ is God. As the Spirit of Prophecy says, essentially and in the highest sense. And then we have the Holy Spirit who is involved. Who's the Holy Spirit? Well, in the Old Testament, it says, My Spirit, His Spirit, and the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the deep and so forth. But let's have a look at the book of Isaiah chapter 48. Isaiah chapter 48. Isaiah 48, the Bible says this. In Isaiah 48 verse 17. Isaiah 48, verse 17, uh, verse 16. It says this. I'll read, I'll begin from verse 15. I, even I, have spoken. So what we have is, as the verse opens up, it opens up with the person that is speaking. And it says, I, even I, have spoken. Yea, I have called him, I have brought him, and he shall make his way prosperous. Now notice verse 16. Come ye near unto me. Hear ye this. So he's saying to each and every one of us, for example, he's saying, come near. Come, gather together. Hear this. What are we to hear? I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, in other words, from whenever time began, whenever origins began, from the time that it was, there am I. Are we following? The speaker's saying, whenever time began, or if there ever was a beginning, there am I. And now, the Lord God 
and his spirit hath what? Have sent me. Now, if the spirit is God, in the sense of belonging to the Lord God, the Father, then he wouldn't be able to send Christ. Isn't that right? I have existed before time was. And now the Lord God and His Spirit, what am I trying to say? The word His Spirit, God's Spirit, my Spirit, doesn't mean possessed by God. Are we following? Because in this text, it tells me that the Spirit, even though He's called His Spirit, has part in sending Christ. Amen? There's three beings in that verse. It co coincides with 1 John 5, 7. It coincides with Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 to 20. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. It coincides with Colossians chapter 2. So if anybody wants to argue about 1 John 5, verse 7, well, by the way, brothers and sisters in Christ, it goes together with all the other verses in the Bible. The Bible says in the book of Colossians, chapter 2, there are three beings in the heavenly trio, as the spirit of prophecy says. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 2, notice what it says. That their, pers that, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of who? Of God. What's the next word? And of the Father. What's the next word? And of Christ. So we have the Father, we have Christ, and who's the other one? God. The mystery of God. And separates that being from the one that's going to be mentioned of the Father. And of Christ. There is no other that fits that but the Holy Spirit. So here we find out that the Godhead took upon themselves roles so that they can pour all heaven down to save the human race. The Father, the Son, the depository promise, the Holy Ghost who is God, uh, the, the Son who is the uh, sacrificial promise, and the Holy Ghost who is the depository promise. In other words, divinity has given themselves to save the human race. And of course, here we have the sovereign will of man and woman. We have the holy angels involved in saving humanity. We know Christ worked the purpose of the law and man's part to play. But what is the work of the Holy Spirit? In John 14, verse 16, down to verse 17. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Again, Jesus Christ says... I will pray the Father. And He will give you what? Another comforter. Three. That He may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth. Who's this comforter that He's talking about? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him, but ye know Him. For He dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I have another subject that deals with dwelling in you and with you, but uh, we can't cover it here. So John 16 verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. What is he referring to? The Holy Spirit. But that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit didn't exist in the old days. My spirit strived with humanity in the days of Noah. The Spirit of God spoke with David and so forth. So the Holy Spirit existed and was in active... Uh, um, he was putting in his efforts to save the human race from the time they fell. But what is Jesus referring to mainly here in John 16, 7? He's referring, referring to the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Amen? But nevertheless, he's saying that the Holy Spirit is coming in full measure. In John 16, 8, Jesus continues on and he says, And when he is come, he will what? Reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So here we see that the role of the Holy Spirit 
whether he was going to come in the day of Pentecost or whether he existed in the days of Noah, whatever time frame he's on earth, the role of the Holy Spirit is to reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So we're going to have a look at reproving the world of sin. We're going to have a look at reproving the world of righteousness. And we're going to look at reproving the world of judgment in the light of our study. Amen? Verse 9, it says, He will reprove the world of sin because they believe not on me. He will reprove the world of sin because they believe not on me. What does it mean by the word reprove? It means to convict, to convince, tell a fault, rebuke. rebuke. So what's the role of the Holy Spirit? He, convict me. Convince me. Tell me my fault. Rebuke me. Isn't that true? That's the, that's the, the role of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Bible says in 1 John 3, 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the world, for sin is the transgression of the law. The Bible says... The role of the Holy Spirit is to convict Peter of sin. The Bible says sin is the transgression of the law. The wages of sin is death. The Holy Spirit convicts me that I've broken his law. He convicts me that the, perp the, the, the end result of breaking the law is death. He convicts me also about something else. Notice what it says in John 15 verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall what? Testify of me. So the work of the Holy Spirit convict me of sin. It tells me, he tells me, that the, 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 the sin is the transgression of the law. And then the Holy Spirit points me and testifies of Christ, the Savior, from sin. Are we following? That's the work of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. So here, in this particular uh, graph that we used in, our, in, the, in the process of how the law being the schoolmaster that leads me to Christ, you see, without the Holy Spirit, we can never be convicted of what the law is telling us. Amen? If the Holy Spirit did not come, if God did not give a depository promise to work on our hearts and convict me of sin, the law couldn't do nothing for me. The coming of Christ on earth couldn't do anything for me. Because there's no agency, there's no power. God is not on earth in order to convict us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the Holy Spirit, His existence in bringing me to Christ and taking me to heaven is of vital importance. If we teach there is no such a thing called the Holy Spirit, we are in danger. Amen. Grave danger. Because we can talk about the beast and all, all these um, powers that be that exist today. But what the devil is trying to do is trying to destroy the foundation of the righteous. If the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Fall. Are we following? Oh, and so he attacks our foundation. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to convict all sin, which is the breaking of God's law. Then the Holy Spirit points the convicted to the remedy, which is Christ. What happens when the sinner accepts the sacrificial promise through the lifelong convicting work of the depository promise? You see, many people out there in the world that haven't accepted Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is striving with them. The angels of darkness set up certain circumstances and, and hereditary and, 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 and um, all the, the things that they love to do and their habits and so forth. If they love to go to nightclubs and so forth, they, the, the, devils of, of the, the devil and his angels will try and put them in an environment where there's a lot of nightclubs. Yeah? They love TV. The, 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 the angels of darkness will try to, um, you know, Talk, talk to the mother or the, or the children. How about we buy another TV? But the Holy Spirit as well is working in the hearts of people, striving with our free will, our mind, and tries to set up circumstances so that the Holy Spirit can set us up to meet the gospel. Amen. Are we following? And that time when that happens, 
The, but the question is, what happens when the sinner accepts the sacrificial promise through the lifelong convicting work of the depository promise who is the Holy Spirit? Ephesians 1 verse 11. Verse 13. It says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, believed in the gospel of salvation, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. When we accept the plan of salvation, this is exactly a direct parallel to the born again experience. Remember when Jesus said, when you're born again, it's like the wind, you don't know. You don't know where the wind comes from and where it goes. Some people might think that you've got to be in the church for so long in order to be born again. That's false. There are people that are, their hearts are open to the working of the Holy Spirit. They might just come into the faith, but they're on fire for God. And those sitting warming seats for 20 years, 15 years, and so forth, think of that person. Oh, don't worry, he's just been here. He doesn't know what he's, what he's doing. And then what we do is we squash that new soul and quench the work of the Holy Spirit in that new soul. And say, why, why do you need to go visiting? Why do you need to do Bible studies and so forth? That's the work of the pastor. Right? So we've got to be careful of who we're dealing with because we don't know who has been born again by the Spirit. And so here we see, the Bible says, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed means a signet or private mark. For security or preservation. So in other words, when we accept the plan of salvation, born again by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is given, not only as a deposit so that we can have eternal life, so that He can guide us to heaven, but is so that we can have security and be preserved until the purchased position is saved. And this is where we are in this presentation, right down there when the Holy Spirit seals us. Now, what must the sinner now do after accepting by faith Christ's merits? Of course, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. And as we progress on to now living a life of following Jesus, keeping the Sabbath as his manner was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath and so forth. The Holy Spirit is now deposited to help us obey. What must the sinner now do after accepting by faith Christ's merits? Well, this is where sanctification begins. Sanctification begins at the time when we are justified by faith. Justification and sanctification, they go together. When we are justified... Then we are imputed and imparted righteousness kicks in. And then we move through the process of sanctification, which is a work of a lifetime. Why is it a work of a lifetime? Because now the Holy Spirit is going to mold, rebuke, and cleanse us as we continue to go towards heaven. Amen? Amen? Now, we either are reformed by the Holy Spirit at this point in time, or we grieve the Holy Spirit. Is there a condition for the forgiven sinner to have continual fellowship with the Holy Spirit? Is there a condition? The Bible says in Acts 5 verse 31 and 32, Him hath God exalted with His right hand to be a prince and a savior. Who's the prince and the savior? Jesus. For to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And then the Bible says after we have accepted Jesus and repented of our sins and God has forgiven us for our sins then the Bible says in verse 32 and we are his witnesses of these things and so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey so the life after we accept Jesus Christ and we now proceed on to walking following taking the steps of Christ Day by day, the Holy Spirit is helping us and God continues to give the Holy Spirit to them that continue to obey. But what happens if we don't obey? Well, this is what happens. We continue on a cycle of repent, back and forth, and back and forth. 
In other words, we continue to be stuck here. And we never have a life of victory over sin because we repent, we sin. We repent, we sin. We repent, we sin. And the Holy Spirit becomes grieved until the day we quench the Spirit of God. But if we continue to move forward, day by day, moment by moment, living the life that the Holy Spirit convicts us of through the Word, then, by God's grace, we are saved. Okay, I'm going a bit backwards here. In 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, we all know about the story of Samuel and the story of Saul, the first king of Israel. The Bible says in verse 22, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord had great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. To God, obedience is better than sacrifice. Now that's where obedience comes into the scheme of things. Amen? Not when we are sinners in need of a Savior and we just try to work our way to heaven. No. It's after we accept Jesus Christ as Lord, as our, as Lord and Savior and follow Him by, 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 through love. And then the Bible says, Jesus says, if you love me, Keep my commandments. And by the love of God indwelling in our hearts, by God's grace, that we now obey God with all our heart, strength, and soul. And God says, Peter, obedience to me is better than a thousand bulls, a thousand lambs that you can offer on the altar. What did, what did David say when he repented in, in, in the book of Psalms? Amen. Thou, you don't desire sacrifice. Where, what position was David in? He was in the side where he was a sinner needing to see his character in the law to be led to Christ. So no amount of works could he do at that point in time in order to save him. So he said, Lord, no amount of sacrifices could I give to you can repay my debt to you. It's a contrite and a broken spirit. Why a contrite and broken spirit? Because he's seen himself in the law. He's committed adultery. He's hurt God. And as a result of that, Christ had died on his behalf. And because of his contrite and broken spirit, that the Son of God, God the Son, Jesus Christ, was to come and die for him, he broke down and said, I can't offer anything but a contrite and a broken spirit. Amen. And so here we see that the Bible says, after we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to obey is better than sacrifice, to hearken than the fat of rams. Verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Rebellion meaning disobedience. If we disobey, God says, we're a witch. We're stubborn. We worship idols. Is given to them that obey by faith. In 1 John 5, 4, the Bible says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Galatians 5, 6, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith, which now what? Works. Keep the commandments. Obedience is better than sacrifice. If you love me, keep my commandments. Bible says... The faith that now works by love. Amen? Amen? John 14, verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Now what else is the work of the Holy Spirit? John 16, verse 8 and 9. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness, righteousness and of judgment. Now, he's going to reprove the world of righteousness. What is righteousness? The Bible says in Psalms 119 verse 172, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. You see, after we meet Jesus, Jesus says, Peter, I've saved you. My works for you is to save you. And if you have, you have accepted my works for you, now please, Peter, if you love me now, 
because I first loved you, obey my commandments. Amen? And at that point in time, the Bible says, all my commandments. And now the Holy Spirit is going to enforce that statement by Jesus Christ, and he's going to continue to convict me of righteousness, which is all God's commandments. So every day, moment by moment, day by day, as I journey through my Christian experience, the Holy Spirit's work is not only now to reprove me of sin, now he's done that, I've accepted the plan of salvation, now he's going to continue in my life to convict me of righteousness, which is keeping the commandments of God. Amen? Amen. And then as I continue to live, the progression of the sanctification, which is a work of a lifetime, is pro pro progressing in my life. And everything to do with God's law, God's commandment. What else is the work of the Holy Spirit? Amen. John 16 verse 8. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. I'm applying this verse in our personal walk with God. Now, judgment. Peter, not only that you accepted Jesus, that the Holy Spirit is convicting you of a life of righteousness in order to try and live a life of righteousness through Jesus Christ by faith and love. But now, you've got to remember that God judges. He will judge your works. Yeah? That's why the Bible says in Revelation that God judges our works. Works are under judgment. So we live a life of being convicted by the Holy Spirit to live a life of righteousness, which is keeping the commandments of God. And then God is looking down from heaven whether His law which we are professing to keep, whether we are living up to the standard of righteousness. Because we are judged by? By the law. The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 10 to 12, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Where is that commandment quoted from? Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. We're not talking about other laws. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law, so speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged, they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. So, as we're living a life of righteousness, all thy commandments are righteousness. As the Holy Spirit tries to help us to live a life of righteousness, and as we cooperate with the power of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says there is coming a, a time when God is now going to look at it as law. And the Holy Spirit convicts us that there is a law that we need to uh, obey. There is a law that measures our life. And therefore, the Bible says, when it comes to the end time, God is going to say, have you met the standards of my commandments? Either we do that or we go the other way, which is disobedience to God's law. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He will continually to tell us truth. Continue to tell us truth. The Bible says in John 14, 6, I will pray the Father, he'll give you another comforter, even the spirit of truth. He dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Very interesting, I came across a verse. I don't think, I, I've forgotten the verse, but it says something like, if the Holy Spirit dwells in us, when it comes to the day of resurrection, that is the key that God is going to use to resurrect the dead. It's through the Holy Spirit's indwelling in us. If the Holy Spirit does not dwell in us, God will never be able to resurrect the dead. Romans chapter 8. Thank you, Pastor. Romans chapter 8, where it clearly tells us the indwelling of the Holy Spirit has everything to do with our resurrection. Amen. Because of the Holy Spirit bringing us from the grave. Praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit speaks only about truth. John, 1 John 5, 6. This is He that came by water and blood. Even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Praise the Lord. Amen. In our journey home, we follow the way and keep the truth as our Lord Jesus 
has said. We are progressing home. Progressing home. You know, there's a song that says, We are nearing home. Praise the Lord for that. We're nearing home. And so I hope that um, that, is our, that is our hope today. Now, what must we followers of Christ never do? Now that we understand the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, what, what, what must we never do? And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. We, there's, it seems like the Holy Spirit seals us twice. If we, if, if we accept the plan of salvation, he seals, God seals us with the Holy Spirit, the positive promise, so that he can ensure us having the inheritance. But if we, through the, 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 our walk to keep the righteousness of God, the Holy Spirit sees he's trying to convict us of living a life of righteousness, but we disobey, we grieve the Holy Spirit, then now the Holy Spirit is going to seal us, not for inheritance, but destruction. Amen? And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, I just wanted to put in uh, a point here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Bible says this. Holy Spirit's giving me a verse to give, so I thought I might just share it with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and verse 17. It says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Do you see how important the health message is? <laughs> the health message is very important, brothers and sisters in Christ, because it has everything to do with helping the work of the Holy Spirit to carry us home. Instead of grieving the Holy Spirit, what, what are we to do? Revelation 21 verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my, my son. Now, who's, the, who's that speaking right there? Who's that speaking right there? The Bible says in verse 6, verse 6. Let's see verse 4 down to verse 6. says, Revelation 21. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be more, no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, now notice it's the one that's sitting upon the throne. He said, Behold, I make all things new. In the context of when the heavenly uh, Jerusalem has condescended from heaven, God is saying to all those that are, have made it, and have overcome, he said, Behold, I make all things what? New. new. Now, when John the Baptist said in John chapter 1, verse 29, as the Lamb was walking, Jesus Christ was walking by, he said, What? Behold the Lamb of God. What do you think the people that were around John the Baptist did? They beheld who? The Lamb of God. Isn't that true? So, that particular time, as God says, Behold, I make what? All things new. You know what, brothers and sisters in Christ? Those that are going to overcome are going to see God recreate. Behold, I'm going to make all things new. Look at my divine power as I make things new. I'm going to have the privilege of seeing what the holy angels and what the fallen angels saw when he created in the beginning. I have a study that the Lord has given to show the time of the battle in heaven and the war between Christ and Satan and the claims of Satan saying that he is God. I will be like the Most High. And in the proving of who God is, God the Son said, let there be light. And there was light. And the angels fallen and unfallen beheld the power of divine Son of God creating the heavens and the earth. God is going to give us that privilege again for those that overcome to see the Son of God create and remake things new. How do I know this is the Son of God? Because the Bible says He's the Omega and the Alpha. And who is the Alpha and the Omega? The beginning and the end. And that is Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 22. 
And so the Bible says, brothers and sisters in Christ, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. I praise the Lord, brothers and sisters, as the Bible says, Our Father in heaven will be our God, and we will be his children. Just want to say, brothers and sisters in Christ, that God has done everything he can to save the human race. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Or I can say the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Taking upon themselves roles in order to save the human race. The promise of the coming of the Savior, the sacrificial promise, who is God. The promise of the depository promise, the Holy Spirit, who is God. And he has given himself holy. Oh, heaven has given himself in order to save the human race. Amen. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, I'd like to appeal to us today that he has given us sufficient power to overcome. Who's the other party involved in the plan of salvation? It's you and I. It's our sovereign will that either we cooperate with the work that God has done for us in order so that, we, so that we can make it to heaven, or we do not cooperate. God never forces our will. Amen. He appeals to us. And that's so beautiful, brothers and sisters, because God, it's a revelation of God's beautiful character. Even though He's high and lofty and sits upon many hills and thrones in heaven, the Bible says, I dwell with him that is of a broken and contrite and humble spirit. Amen. And so it shows us the character of God. God is so powerful, infinite, but he respects your will so much that he rather die to win you over. Amen. And so by God's grace, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we accept the character of God. He came to die, seek and save that which was, that which was lost. Who would like to accept the plan of salvation. Who would like to accept the work that Christ had done for us? And the Holy Spirit's work. God the Father's work. And the Holy Angels. Who would like to accept that today? If you do, please raise your hand. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven. We approach your throne of grace and mercy in Jesus' name. We thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Lord, for the message that you've given us through this camp meeting. And at this point in time, Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you be with us. That you continue, Lord, to work in our hearts so that we may live the life that you want us to live. Help us to submit self to you moment by moment today. Tomorrow, Lord, we may never have. But help us, Lord, to walk today according to your precepts, according to your righteousness. And please, Lord, you've promised the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And use and listen to his word as he convicts our minds of the words that you have spoken. Keep us now, Lord, in the blessed name of Jesus Christ we call. Amen. Amen. This moment in